Cell specification, we talked about there are three types of cell specification, autonomous, conditional, and syncytial. But if you break down all three of those, there's really two major factors in specification. Number one is cell-cell interactions, so the interactions that cells have with one another to start specifying one another. This is mainly included in conditional specification. And then the second way is mostly syncytial and autonomous specification, where you have a asymmetrical distribution, meaning a disproportionate or a, uh, it's not equivalent throughout the cytoplasm, of either RNA or proteins or both. So you have transcription factors, which are the proteins that activate uh, a lot of the genomics, uh, some which will repress various genes, and we're going to talk about those today. So these are the main two types of ways that all three of these modes of specification use. Conditional is typically cell-cell interaction. Uh, syncytial and autonomous specification use asymmetrical distribution of these RNAs as well as proteins in the cytoplasm to begin the activation of gene expression. Okay, now speaking of asymmetrical distribution, there are three mo modes of distribution that you need to know about. And these are done usually before fertilization. So let's go through the three. The first one is the molecules, such as the proteins, or in some cases the RNA, are bound to the cytoskeleton and passively inherited in the cytoplasm. So when the cell divides, they're, they're put in initial places and they're bound to the cytoskeleton and they don't move from those places. So in the initial setting up of the oocyte, certain cells can distribute and put, as you're going to see with the Drosophila today, they might put it at opposite ends of the oocyte. So you have certain RNAs on this side that are bound to the cytoskeleton, certain RNAs that are on this side that are bound to the cytoskeleton, and they're not going to move from that spot. So they stay where they're put. That's, the, that's one mode of how you can distribute um, RNA and proteins in the cytoplasm is the cytoskeleton holds them in place. Number two, during the processes of um, uh, cleavage, the molecules are transported along the cytoskeleton. You should know that microtubules, which are part of the cytoskeleton, can be used to traffic vesicles as well as molecules um, from one part to another. So there are times where the cytoskeleton will actively move some of these molecules around. They're not necessarily going to stay in the same place, but there are certain mechanisms in place you're going to see in the C. elegans today that starts pushing certain molecules to one side or the other based upon the fertilization event. And the third one is during mitosis, due to the nature of the mitotic spindle and the cytoskeleton, as the cells pull, you know, sister chromatids away from one another, sometimes you get some of these RNAs and molecules that also get pulled away from one another during mitosis and then subsequent cleavage of the cell. So that's also another mechanism is that they might be associated with the centrosome and they'll follow these nuclei as they move to one cell or the other and, and that disproportionately distributes these molecules as well. So these are the three main mechanisms. They'll either stay where they're put in the cytoskeleton They'll be actively moved due to some type of event that occurs in fertilization or during the actual cleavage process where mitosis is occurring, they'll be moved with the nuclei so that they're disproportionate into new cells. These are the three main ways in which you can asymmetrically distribute some of what we call the maternal factors. We call them maternal factors, these RNAs and these proteins that are put into the oocyte before even fertilization begins. So I told you in the beginning that oocytes are not universal in terms of how these molecules are distributed, and it, never, it doesn't even stay the same way that it was put together. Things start shifting around even before the first um, mitotic event. So the three model organisms that we're going to study today for this lecture are all invertebrate model organisms. So the first one is the sea urchin. These are commonly used mainly for fertilization and cleavage. So we look at 
We use them to study the fertilization process that occurs in development, as well as the initial cleavage processes that occur in development. One of the reasons why we use these is because they're easy to collect. There's lots and lots of them. So they spawn in huge amounts of quantities. You get a lot of data from them. They're very easy to use in laboratory conditions and to grow in, in labor, laboratory conditions. So the fertilization process can be done in a laboratory. We can watch their development under a microscope. So it's very advantageous. The cells are clear. You can watch them dividing. Um, you can see it pretty much all the way through the end. The embryos are transparent. The envelope that surrounds them, in a lot of cases, that's not the, the case where you can't see what's going on inside. But with sea urchins, you can see what's going on inside. I'm going to show you a couple more videos. I've already showed you some of them, which I'm going to show you again. But that's why we, we use these as a model organism is because of all of these factors. We can, we can manipulate them in a laboratory environment. We can watch them develop under a microscope. There's a lot that we can do. They spawn in massive quantities. The, the main disadvantage of you have to collect these embryos or these organisms and then work with them in the laboratory. We can't propagate the species under laboratory conditions. It's hard to take them once they reach maturity and then go through the process all over again. So that is one disadvantage of using sea urchins is, is unlike when we're doing frogs or mice or chickens, it's, you can't really reproduce them in laboratory conditions uh, due to the nature of their development and, uh, and subsequent uh, maturation. But these are all the advantages that we use for sea urchins. Make sure you know those. So let's look at sea urchins' mode of cleavage. Okay. As, because of the distribution of the yolk, in the animal pole, you get these middle-sized cells, which we call mesomeres. The vegetal pole having a little bit thicker yolk. They don't divide as uh, much, so you get slightly larger cells, which we call macromeres. But then at the very, very tip of the vegetal pole, you get these tiny cells, which we call micromeres. Now, these cells are critical in the development of the sea urchin. If you look at a fate map of the sea urchin, even before the cell divides, what do you see? Even before the first cell division, what's the fate map showing you? You already have the three germ layers that are being established. Why? What is making it so that those are pre-established? The asymmetrical distribution of the molecules in the oocyte that will create different proteins or morphogenic gradients that will be sequestered as these cells undergo cell division. So you can see that after the first few cell divisions, the maternal components that will cause these cells to become ectoderm are sequestered within the cytoplasm of those cells. Those maternal components which are found here are going to be sequestered to these regions here and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's what we were talking about at the beginning about these molecules being asymmetrically distributed within the cytoplasm of the oocyte. These are done by cells outside of the oocyte. You know, we typically call these nursing cells that will put these various molecules in various places in the initial stages of oocyte development. Now, one of the things you have to know about the micromeres, we, ha we haven't really talked too much about what we call organizers, but the micromeres are under pure autonomous specification. Now, this is where things might get a little dicey. Pay close attention. If we were to separate these cells out and let them develop on their own, the maternal components that are in these cells will develop autonomously. However, these cells will only go so far without interaction with the other cells. So in reality, all of these cells, these mesomeres and macromere cells, are under conditional specification because they do require interactions with other cells to ultimately develop or undergo the specification they need for, uh, um, uh, for their development. The micromeres, on the other hand, are not influenced by the interaction with the other cells. 
and they themselves can develop autonomously without any type of interaction with these other cells, which is why we see that the micromeres develop, have autonomous specification, but the meso and macromeres here are under conditional specification. So these cells, in fact, require interactions with these micromeres, paracrine factors, as well as juxtacrine factors. So both paracrine and juxtacrine interactions are required between the micromeres and these other cells for them to fully develop, for them to take on their respective fates, which is why these cells we call conditional specification because it does require interaction with these micromeres. The micromeres, on the other hand, are under autonomous specification. They don't receive signals from these other cells to differentiate into the types of cells that they need to become. So remember I told you that these were transparent. That's why we can see these cells dividing at the various stages. Now this fluid-filled center, what do we call that? The blastocele, the blastocele. This is the fluid-filled area that's necessary for the later stages of gastrulation that are going to occur. So what happens is these cells will start dividing and then through osmosis, water will be pulled in to create this internal liquid environment that causes the cells to be pushed out to the periphery of the uh, um, blastocyst. Pretty much all of the cells, except for the micromeres, are under conditional specification. Just those mesoderm cells, those micromeres that are at the vegetal pole, are under autonomous specification. The anterior-posterior axis is determined primarily by the animal vegetal pole. The animal pole is the anterior axis of the sea urchin. The vegetal pole is the posterior axis. These are predetermined by those maternal components that are in the oocyte uh, uh, before cleavage even begins. So in, you'll find that in some, uh, in the next example I give you, the anterior posterior axis is, is actually determined by where the sperm enters rather than pre-established maternal components. So it's not the same in every organism. So here's the anterior portion, the animal pole. Here's the posterior portion, portion, the vegetal pole. Here we have the mesomeres, the macromeres, and then those micromeres. Um, again, why is this vegetal pole, why is this mesoderm if it's supposed to be in between ectoderm and endoderm? What's going to happen? Invagination. These cells, some of these cells are going to invaginate. The micromeres are actually going to ingress. What does ingression mean? They become disconnected. They're going to go from an epithelial to mesenchyme transition. They're going to move inward towards where that blastocele is at. And a lot of these are going to form what we call the skeletal rods, which are part of the skeletal system of the sea urchin. So here are some of the respective fates. We start off with the initial zygote. And as the mesomeres and the macromeres and the micromeres start dividing up, you can see, based upon the color, ectoderm, neural tissue. Remember, neural is a little bit darker um, blue. Um, I'm not going to differentiate between some of these different colors of oranges, but we have endoderm and then we have mesoderm. So most of the mesoderm comes from the most, uh, the, 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 the largest uh, micromeres at the um, bottom of the uh, uh, vegetal pole. So here's, once the blastocyl forms, this is kind of the fate map of the cell. You can see already that the uh, mesoderm is already getting ready to uh, um, uh, ingress, and then the endoderm actually envelops here and then invaginates. So you can see that these micromeres start ingressing inward. These play a, a vital role. These are under autonomous specification that will start conditioning other cells to become what they're to become. Eventually, all these uh, uh, mesoderm cells ingress, and the endoderm starts invaginating. So these cells start invaginating. This is eventually going to form uh, the, uh, the gut. Remember that the endoderm forms the digestive system of an organism. Once this extends all the way through, then it's going to be essentially the anus in the posterior region to the mouth. That's the digestive system of the sea urchin. You can see how these mesoderm, these micromeres, eventually become the skeletal rods or the skeletal system of the organism. And then, of course, you have the ectoderm and some of the neural tissue that surrounds 
this organism. We don't take, we don't really use this too much to study some of the later stages, as I said. Mostly it's used for fertilization and the initial stages of cleavage when we study um, distribution of maternal components and these mRNAs and such. But I just wanted to point out some key factors here. We have Wnt signaling with the beta-catenin pathway. We have notch delta signaling. These are some of the factors that are required for the conditioning of the endoderm from the mesoderm. So the mesoderm, these micromeres, are the signaling center. They're going to release Wnt signaling that's going to then signal the Wnt uh, pathway in the endoderm cells, and these will then start turning on various genes that are necessary for them to invaginate and form the digestive system of the sea urchin. So that's why these are under autonomous specification, they already have all their own signals, but they will then condition or send out paracrine signaling to condition many of the other cells that are adjacent to them, especially the endoderm. Then beta catenin pathway will, will actually uh, cause transcription of very specific genes that will then cause these cells to become specified to be endoderm. Here again, you can see this is an electron scanning micrograph. So this is a very high resolution, high detail showing of the invagination of the endoderm cells of the vegetal pole. Let's talk about C. elegans. Um, these are a worm that are used um, for development for a lot of reasons. Number one, we can trace every cell. And I say, I mean every cell. We know exactly how many cells are going to be in the hermaphrodite. There are some cases where there are not some hermaphrodite uh, C. elegans where they have over 1,000, but the hermaphrodite C. elegans have 959 cells every time. Okay? We can trace the lineage of every single cell, where it's going, what it becomes. It was one of the first organisms that we were able to do a um, uh, the, Gene, or sequence the entire genome. This was done while we were doing the human genome sequence for 10 years. This was completed before the human genome sequence. We were able to sequence this. And the reason for that is because they only have about 3% of the DNA that we have in terms of the amount. So it, it was a lot less to sequence. Although they have almost the same number of genes that you and I have. They have about 18 to 20,000 genes. We have 20 to 25,000 genes. And a lot of that comes into their regulation of their genes. As we talked about uh, uh, alternate splicing of our genes, that's what makes us so different, amongst many other things. But one of the big things is that we can splice our genome so many different ways. They have very few splice variants uh, of their genes. So they're very simple organisms to study because there's not a lot of complexity and how they make their proteins. So we've sequenced all of their genome. We know all the ins and outs of their genes. Um, again, the, one of the advantages is being able to study them in a laboratory, being able to do fertilization and development in laboratory conditions. These we can continue from one generation to the next. Due to the fact that they're hermaphroditic, they self-fertilize. They produce both sperm and egg, which means that they, it, they do undergo meiosis. They do produce both sperm and egg, and they can undergo this meiotic process. I mean, plants are hermaphroditic, so it's not any different than a plant self-pollinizing because it produces both sperm and egg. So these C. elegans, uh, it's just odd because these are one of the few animals that are truly hermaphroditic in the sense that they can produce both sperm and egg uh, in the same organism. So 959 cells. We know exactly how many. Uh, and then, again, the eggs are transparent, so we can watch these embryos develop from fertilization all the way to the end. And it only takes 16 hours for their entire embryogenesis process. Very rapid turnover to be able to have these things develop. Okay? They're one of the faster organisms in which development occurs. So they're, they're used quite often because of the rapidity in which we can undergo this developmental process and be able to observe it. They've been able to do uh, fate mapping for pretty much all the cells. They've been able to trace the lineage of every cell due to a variety of different 
fate mapping techniques between dyes and fluorescence and things of that sort. So we know quite a bit about the development of C. elegans. There's still a lot to learn, but a lot of the mechanisms that are found in C. elegans are translatable to understanding other organisms, including ourselves, which is why they're a good model organism to use. So these are a lot of the advantages. We can trace every cell line. Even though we can watch sea urchins, we can't, uh, I don't know whether they've traced every single cell, but they have uh, for C. elegans. So here's some of the anatomy of the C. elegans. They'll produce in one area the oocytes, in another area they'll, they'll produce the sperm. So they are hermaphroditic in that they produce both types of gametes. Let's look at the initial stages. These are fer fairly fascinating. Now, they are holoblastic, like sea urchins in their cleavage process, in that the entire oocyte undergoes cleavage. You don't have any part of it that's not undergoing cleavage. Rotational. This plays a key role, especially in the initial specification process. So one thing about the C. elegans is the initial oocyte doesn't have any polarity to it. In fact, the Maternal components um, are spread out pretty much evenly throughout the entire oocyte, at least some of the ones that matter. So the question becomes, how does it start forming the axes, the anterior and the posterior axes? Well, the sperm can enter in pretty much any place it wants to. When the sperm enters in, that will become the posterior end of the C. elegans. So wherever the sperm fertilizes, that's where the posterior end is going to be. What happens is the cytoskeleton will move it and push it to one end. So let's say it, it fertilizes right up here, then it'll move that nuclei down to this region right here, and that becomes the posterior region where it will fuse with the oocyte nuclei. So how does it determine that the, where the sperm uh, um, enters into is pulled to the closest end of the oocyte fuses with the nuclei and that will form the posterior end. How does that happen? What will, what will happen is it starts causing the cytoskeleton to create these movements of the, uh, of the cytoplasm that will push proteins, maternal components, all to the other end of the oocyte. Okay? So when the sperm pronucleus enters into uh, the uh, um, oocyte, it causes a reaction in the cytoskeleton that will actually start pushing. Now remember, we talked in the beginning about how one of the ways in which you can asymmetrically distribute molecules is through the cytoskeleton, and this is one of the ways. The cytoskeleton will actually push a bunch of these proteins to one side of the oocyte, pretty much clearing this side of certain uh, factors. And this is what will become the posterior end. Eventually, these nuclei will fuse together, cytokinesis will occur after mitosis, and the anterior cell will become most of the embryo itself. The posterior cell becomes the germline cells. So these cells right here, these P cells, if you look at a fate map, they're purple. Remember, purple means germline cells. So these, and here's where things get a little crazy. These germline cells are under complete autonomous specification. They now have the proteins that they need and the mRNA and, and all the factors that they need to differentiate into the germline cells. And this will eventually become the oocyte and the sperm in the hermaphroditic adult. The other cells, these, this other cell right here, that is, and its subsequent cells are under conditional specification. So again, we have two separate types of specification in the same organism, where these cells under a complete autonomous specification, the germline cells, and these other cells are under conditional specification. So what happens after that first cleavage? So once the sperm enters into it and causes the cytoskeleton to push a bunch of these maternal components, I'm not even going to, I mean, the book talks about PAR, you know, these PAR elements and, and whatnot. I'm not going to, we don't need to really get into the dynamics. That's graduate work to get into the, the names of all of these proteins. On occasion, I'll mention some proteins if they really matter. 
Um, but most of the time, we're just going to look at the mechanics of what's going, going on here. Because honestly, if we went through every stupid protein, your head would explode. Um, mine did during my PhD. So um, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to stress you out more than you have to. Now, we don't know all of the factors involved. But we do know that if you remove these cells, like through an isolation experiment, that because they're not adjacent to other cells, they will not take on the fates that they should. So we know that they must interact with certain cells in order for the embryo to pattern itself. We may not know all the reasons why, but we do know that they are required because of the various isolation experiments that have been done, where they will remove this cell and they'll see what happens as a result. Now, this is called rotational holoblastic cleavage, and that actually plays a big role in its axis specification. Because what happens is as the cells start undergoing mitosis, the, the blastocyst starts elongating. And as the cells undergo rotational cleavage, they start shifting in such a way that you start creating the dorsal ventral axis and the left right axis. So here's what we know about these initial stages of cleavage. When the AB cell here undergoes rotational cleavage, so what happens is the mitotic spindle shifts and it undergoes cleavage uh, um, along a different axis. Then the one more anteriorly and the one more posteriorly, the posterior one gets kind of pushed up and that becomes the dorsal region. So this ABP uh, cell will be in the dorsal end of the C. elegans. Whereas these cells on, on down here that come from these cells right here, again, when this cell, when the P cell splits off, it takes with it what it needs to become the germline, and the remaining cytoplasm doesn't have any of those maternal components. And that becomes what we call the EMS cell. This is going to become the mesoderm and the endoderm, this region right here, this cell. These cells right here primarily become ectoderm, although there are some mesoderm in there as well. So here's kind of what happens. The AB cell will split and continue to split. Most of the AB cells become the ectoderm. The EMS cell, this one cell, as it splits, will become both the mesoderm and the endoderm. Some further cells that split from these don't get these autonomous components. You can see how the P line cells, these are under autonomous specification. It pretty much says, this is what I need to become the germline, you get the rest. You know, and, it, and as those cells divide off from it, they'll take on various fates depending upon the interactions with all these other cells. Okay? So let me simplify this for you. The AB cell, the first cell that's more anterior, is under conditional specification. The germline cells are under autonomous specification. Even after the first cell division, they've already determined what they're going to become. Now, let's look at the axes. The anterior posterior axis of the C. elegans is primarily determined by where the sperm enters in. The initial setting up of the oocyte does not have an anterior posterior axis, not like the sea, uh, sea urchin, where the animal pole is the anterior axis and the vegetal pole is the posterior axis. That's already predetermined by the distribution of maternal components and the yolk. Dorsal ventral axis. This is predetermined by the rotational cleavage. As the AB cell rotates and cleaves, the one that's a little more posterior, that's where ABP comes into play, the P is posterior, and the interaction between the EMS cell that is, uh, uh, comes off from the, one of the germline cells, that creates the dorsal ventral. So this APB, uh, cell, a ABP cell is the dorsal side, and the EMS is the ventral side. The left-right axis comes about a little bit later on when the EMS cell splits and it interacts with the anterior AB cell. And we're not going to get into the dynamics of how all that's done. But I do want you to know that in the earliest stages, only after a couple of cell divisions, already you've patterned the anterior posterior axis, dorsal ventral axis, and the left right hemispheres of the C. elegans. 
This is earlier than most organisms do it uh, in, in terms of its patterning. So we don't know all the reasons on why the interaction between these two cells create the dorsal ventral axis, but we do know that it is required due to isolation experiments where we've taken the cell out and seen what happens and you don't get dorsal ventral axis. You don't get these cells becoming what they should. Drosophila, Melanogaster. These have been studied for a long time. Uh, for a while they weren't used, but then they were brought back into play because of genetic studies, because of further genetic studies and genetic manipulation. So in early stages, we, when we had experimental embryology, uh, we used them, and then they, they weren't showing us as much as some of the other organisms. And then when we started getting into genetic manipulation, it was all about Drosophila, which is why they're used quite extensively uh, as the invertebrate model for, uh, for development. So they're, they're perfect for genetic studies. There are homologs, which are genes that have the same function in Drosophila as they do in us, which is why when we study them here, we're studying ourselves as well. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we study here are the Hox genes, which play a big role in vertebrate development. Now, they don't have Hox genes in Drosophila. They're called homeotic selector genes, but they are homologous. They are homologs uh, in terms of their function in patterning. So, very ideal for genetic studies. They have a very rapid life cycle. Do lots of breeding with them. Um, they have four huge chromosomes. They call them polyteen chromosomes. And one of the advantages of these polyteen chromosomes is you know exactly where the genes are on these chromosomes. It's not like us having 46 chromosomes where you have to line them all up and put them in this order and find out like that. There are huge, four huge chromosomes in the Drosophila where you just know exactly where these genes are found. And one of the biggest advantages of uh, Drosophila is being able to ma manipulate their genetics and then see various mutations that come about. They're very easy to mutate and then see what happens. They're used quite extensively for genetic breeding studies as well as genetic manipulation studies. Just, it, it's all about Drosophila, really. Now, the oocyte initially is surrounded by what we call nursing cells nursing cells and follicle cells. They play a huge role in setting up those maternal components, the RNA that's necessary to begin the patterning of the Drosophila. We're going to talk about genes. So we haven't really talked about too many genes now. Now we are because these genes have been so thoroughly studied, we know what role they play in the development of Drosophila. Remember that Drosophila have superficial cleavage and syncytial specification. So what's the difference? Again, superficial cleavage is where because of the uh, thickness of the yolk, as the cells undergo mitosis, as they're undergoing, and they skip the growth phase, they're just undergoing DNA replication and then DNA synthesis and then division and, and then so on and so forth. They just go through those two cycles. Uh, uh, for several uh, periods of time. Eventually, all the nuclei are pushed out to the perimeter, the superficial layer, where the, the middle pretty much is, uh, has the yolk, and you see all these nuclei around the edge. Eventually, the cytoplasm will be uh, pushed down and around each of these nuclei, creating individual cells. So superficial cleavage. Cleavage doesn't occur until all the nuclei are around the periphery of the cell, and then at a certain stage, the cytoplasm moves and sequesters around each one of these nuclei and they become individual cells. Okay. The initial stages of cleavage, uh, the first 12 occur very, very rapidly, every, uh, I believe, eight minutes or so. And then there comes a point where it slows down. Uh, about the 13th cell division, it starts slowing down. And uh, one of the biggest things that happens there is in these initial stages, it's all about the maternal um, uh, RNA, where they're being translated into protein and they're establishing these gradients. There comes a point where these gradients then start turning on 
the genomic material. They start transcribing proteins from these nuclei here to start creating even more gradients. One of the proteins that's responsible for that transition, kind of mid to late uh, transition, is called smog. Yes, named after the dragon in The Hobbit, okay? So, so smog is the protein. Now, what does it do? It actually sits, uh, as it's being made, it starts sitting and preventing transcription or translation of the maternal RNA. So smog is one of those RNAs that's in there, and as translation gets initiated, um, it, it, uh, as it builds up, then it eventually stops the translation of the maternal RNA, and then those proteins can only access the genomic DNA to start transcription and then translation. Okay. So cleavage, superficial cleavage, if you look at the cytoskeleton or the cytoskeleton and the cytoplasm here, all the nuclei get sequestered around the periphery. Eventually, these actin filaments will pull the uh, cell membrane down and di divide each of these cells off, and then you'll have all of these cellular blastoderm uh, all around the periphery of the Drosophila. Okay. At that point, so much has already happened, and that's what we're, we're going to discuss, is once the nuclei have been sequestered within their own cells, there are so many different patterns of morphogen gradients that get pulled into those individual nuclei that that is what initiates further gastrulation and specification. So it's necessary that these nuclei are not sequestered into their individual cells until those morphogen gradients are set up throughout the entire cytoplasm of the oocyte. So before their uh, uh, cleavage has uh, occurred and sequestered each one of these, they're called a syncytial blastoderm because it's all just one, one cell. And all of the nuclei are within one common cytoplasm. Eventually, once they all get partitioned off, then they're called cellular blastoderm because they all have their individual single cells uh, that will then start interacting with one another. So that mid-blastula transition where the mitotic rate slows down, that's what smog helps out with, is it is involved right about that mid-blastula transition that uh, slows down maternal RNA transcription and you get increased of genomic RNA transcription going on. Now, in terms of gastrulation, gastrulation is, again, the movement of the cells. You get invagination, you get um, convergent extension and epiboly and whatnot. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, although we'll go over a few key aspects of it. One of the things is at the ventral region, you get invagination of cells that will eventually become the mesoderm. So the mesoderm forms in the ventral, very similar to the sea urchin in that the mesoderm is in the ventral region and then it pulls up inward and uh, uh, invaginates inward. The only difference is in sea urchins, it's ingression, and here it's actual invagination of, those, uh, of that tissue. You can see it right here. So here in red, this is the ventral region of the Drosophila. The cells will invaginate and actually pinch off and form this almost uh, um, uh, tube that will become the mesoderm. The ectoderm and the neural tissue eventually will surround it, and the neural tissue will be in between the mesoderm and the ectoderm that starts forming the nervous system. Eventually, these cells, these endoderm cells, will be completely engulfed through the gastrulation movement, as well as the germline cells. There's a few cells here, these called pole cells, that will go with the endoderm cells that will uh, kind of be pulled in with them and then become part, and that will form the the sex cells, so the sperm and the egg, uh, respectively, based upon their, the sex of the Drosophila. So here's looking at the ventral region. Here's what we call the ventral furrow, where the ventral cells are invaginating and eventually will, will pinch off inward. And uh, here's the closing off of the ventral furrow, where the, the, the cells are now internally. One of the disadvantages you can see here is we can't see internally. They're not clear. The cells aren't clear like the other two, like C. urchins and C. elegans. So we can see kind of what's going on on the outside, but we can't watch all the cells 
Uh, they've done studies where they've cut them open, and that's why we know what's happening internally. But it's a little harder than just being able to watch the cells do their thing without having to manipulate them at all. This region right here also invaginates. We call this a cephalic furrow, where it's going to separate the head region from the body region. And this is just another gastrulation process of invagination um, that separates those two regions. Here we're looking at the dorsal end. You can see the pole cells. These are the germline cells that will eventually be pulled in as the endoderm undergoes what we call conversion extension, where the cells just undergo mitosis and they move and then they get pulled into the cell. Later on, you can actually see the segments starting to form. And we're going to show tomorrow all of the genes that are responsible for for causing these gastrulation movements that will cause these segments to occur within the Drosophila. Eventually, you get the patterning of the legs and the wings. One of the things we've shown that we're going to uh, get to as well tomorrow is these patternings have everything to do with the initial stages of these maternal components. And as they get set up, it turns on the homeotic selector genes, or the Hux genes, the Hux genes in us, homeotic selector in the Drosophila, and we've shown that if you cause different Hux genes to be expressed in different regions, you can actually get flies with two sets of wings. Or you can get, uh, um, you can get arms where the eyes should be and things of that sort. Kind of crazy stuff. Um, so we're going to go into all the genomic dynamics of how this is done. Most of what we study as far as axis formation in Drosophila is anterior-posterior polarity. That's the major thing we use Drosophila for. We do know some of the aspects of dorsal ventral patterning in the Drosophila, and we do know some aspects of left-right patterning. But we know the most about anterior-posterior patterning, and it is absolutely fascinating to show how it goes from the maternal components to the genomic components to the homeotic selector genes that eventually form each of the segments of the Drosophila. And we've seen direct correlations between key transcription factors and the eventual morphology of the uh, uh, things that uh, uh, come about from that. The nursing cells and the follicle cells will put mRNA of many different types, but the main ones we're going to look at are bicoid, hunchback, nanos, caudal, and torso. These are the five that are what we call the maternal effect genes. And we call them maternal effect genes because they're put in by the maternal cells, the nursing cells and the uh, uh, follicle cells that get the ball rolling. Okay? This is a perfect example of why the cytoplasm is not distributed symmetrically, why it's all, all asymmetrically distributed and where you can start the initial body plan of the organism. And most of what we're going to talk about today is the anterior-posterior axis. I am going to make quick mention of the dorsal-ventral axis, and it's very easy, primarily determined by a, a, um, a protein called dorsal. You want to know where dorsal is actually expressed? In the ventral region. Yeah, whatever. So I don't know why they do that to us. But um, let's start with this. Bicoid and nanos. These are the two major ones. Now, bicoid is found in the anterior region of the oocyte. So unlike the C. elegans, where um, there is no anterior posterior pole until fertilization begins, in the Drosophila, it's already predetermined, the anterior and the posterior end. In fact, there's only a tiny area in the posterior end of the oocyte that allows sperm to enter in. Sperm cannot enter into anywhere else in the oocyte. It can only enter into a small little region in the posterior end of the oocyte. Now, Drosophila's, the flagellum on the Drosophila sperm is so long that by the time that the, um, uh, the nuclei fuse together and the, the sperm is entering in, the, that, that tail essentially plugs up the hole to prevent any other polyspermy or any other sperm from being able to come in. So that's one of the main mechanisms of Drosophila to prevent polyspermy is that the sperm's flagellum is so long that it just plugs up the hole okay, it's to prevent other sperm from entering into that region. It doesn't have some of the same effects. However, it does 
have um, a reaction even before fertilization begins. And this reaction causes some of this initiation process. So it's not necessarily the fertilization process that initiates these changes in the cytoplasm. It has more to do uh, um, with uh, other mechanisms. So bicoid is the mRNA that is then translated into protein. Now these form what we call morphogen gradients, which are just high concentrations of protein that are diffusing out from a high to a low concentration across the cytoplasm. So if you look, you can see that the bicoid mRNA is sequestered to the most post or anterior end of the oocyte, and as the protein is being trans, uh, translated from the RNA, it just diffuses out and you form this morphogen gradient. High levels of bicoid in the anterior region, and it gets less and less as it moves more posteriorly through diffusion. On the opposite end, you have what we call nanos. Nanos uh, messenger RNA, again, gets translated into nanos protein, and this diffuses as a morphogen gradient as well, from the most posterior end uh, to the anterior. So eventually, you have high levels of bicoid on the anterior, high levels of nanos, and then it just slowly grades down, and that's why we call it a morphogen gradient. There's other uh, proteins that are also being made. Hunchback and caudal are actually initially dispersed evenly throughout the entire cytoplasm of the oocyte. So they're everywhere. Hunchback and caudal start out everywhere. But as bicoid and nanos start being translated, bicoid inhibits caudal, and nanos inhibits hunchback. So it starts restricting hunchback to the more anterior end, and it restricts caudal. Remember I used the words uh, rostral and caudal? Restricts, if you think cost, uh, caudal and posterior, it restricts caudal to the more posterior end of that. Let me see if I can show a picture here. So here, if these are the levels, initially hunchback and caudal are everywhere within the oocyte. But as bicoid and nanos are translated into protein, and you get these morphogen gradients, high levels in the anterior end of bicoid, high levels of nanos in the posterior end, then nanos uh, or bicoid starts um, preventing caudal from being translated and made into a protein. So caudal becomes restricted to the posterior end. And the same thing is true. Nanos prevents hunchback from being translated and then you only get hunchback in the more anterior region. So that's why these are what we call the anterior and posterior maternal effect genes. So bicoid and hunchback are the anterior uh, uh, maternal effect genes. They cause the uh, oocyte to be the anterior pole or uh, uh, polarity, and nanos and caudal, the posterior. Now, torso is not only in one place, it's actually found in both ends, in the most anterior and the most posterior end. They found that the combination of torso and bicoid is necessary for the formation of the head, and torso and nanos is necessary for the formation of the tail. So torso doesn't, isn't in one place, it's actually in both extremities. So torso isn't really an anterior posterior uh, maternal effect gene, but it is necessary in both regions to define those terminal boundaries of the anterior and the posterior pole. So it plays a dual role. It plays a, a, as a single protein, it plays a dual role in combining with these maternal effect genes to form that, because they found that when they inhibited torso, you didn't form a head. And if they inhibited tor uh, torso in the uh, posterior region, you didn't form a tail. They needed that uh, maternal effect gene in both regions. So that's what this is summarizing right here. Bicoid and hunchback in the most anterior region, nanos and caudal in the most posterior region, and torso in both the anterior and the posterior region. These are the five maternal effect genes that I will expect you to know and describe just like I did on how they work together. It's very easy as far as bicoid and nanos, but let me go over uh, hunchback and caudal again. Hunchback and caudal are evenly distributed throughout the entire cytoplasm. But bicoid essentially downregulates or prevents caudal from being translated into protein. And nanos prevents hunchback from being translated into protein. So that's what restricts hunchback to the anterior region and what restricts caudal to the posterior region. 
gap genes. Those are the next group of genes. Then comes the pair rule genes and the sigma polarity genes. So let's start with the gap genes. The gap genes are interesting. Now, the gap genes get turned on by the maternal effect genes. So, and some of these gap genes are also maternal effect genes. Well, really, in fact, just one, hunchback. So hunchback comes back again with a vengeance in the second stage of anterior-posterior patterning. So hunchback is really the only maternal effect gene that is also a gap gene. So you turn on some new genes through transcription and then translation through these pathways, through the bicoid being transcription factors for certain key genes and nanos being transcription factor for other key genes combined with hunchback, combined with uh, caudal and all of these factors. Okay? So here are some of the main ones. We've got Kruppel, NERPS, Hunchback, and Giant. We won't worry about tailless right now. These are the four main ones, Kruppel, NERPS, Hunchback, and Giant. Now, here is the relationship that I want you to understand. One of the things that tends to confuse people at first is they're like, wait, why is Hunchback in the posterior end? Well, what this shows is where it's expressed. It doesn't actually tell you the levels of it. So in fact, over here, there are very low levels of hunchback. You don't have high levels of hunchback, even though hunchback is an anterior gene. But hunchback does get turned on by some of these other genes and as a gap gene gets expressed in these regions. Now there's a hierarchy in these genes. And what do I mean by hierarchy is certain genes repress other genes. So the hierarchy is as follows. Hunchback is the highest on the totem pole. It has the highest hierarchy, which means that in the presence of hunchback, it will prevent the uh, expression of giant, nerfs, and crepel. So where you get these bands of hunchback being expressed, it prevents any of these other genes from being expressed in those regions. Now, giant is next on the list. So giant precedes or supersedes uh, uh, nerfs and crepel. And one of the interesting things about this patterning is when you get the combined effect of bicoid, nanos, hunchback, and caudal, when giant gets turned on, if hunchback isn't here, giant would be expressed right here. But since hunchback is here, giant is restricted to here. Over here, again, giant is only restricted to here because hunchback prevents giant from being expressed right there. So you start creating these band patterns that will form the segments and the pair rule genes and the segment polarity genes we're going to talk about. What's interesting is because these are still gradients, these are morphogen gradients still, that they repress the expression of certain genes right next to them. For example, giant will keep Kruppel restricted to a tiny little area right there. Because giant's expressed right here and right here, it only allows Kruppel to be expressed right here. And in terms of hunchback, it restricts NERPS to this band right here because hunchback is expressed here and here and due to this hierarchy, it creates this very specific gap gene expression pattern. And you don't have to understand much more than that, but these are the gap genes. This hierarchy is what I want you to understand. Wherever hunchback uh, expression occurs, you can't get giant NERPS or crumple. Wherever giant expression is at, you can't get NERPS or Kruppel. And wherever NERPS expression is at, you don't get Kruppel. So Kruppel is the low man on the totem pole, so to speak. It gets restricted to the only area where you don't get any of these other gap genes being expressed. And they, they, they reinforce one another. These morphogen gradients keep themselves in very specific bands because if Kruppel were to try to expand um, then number one, NERPS prevents it, and number two, giant in this morphogen gradient keeps it restricted to this tiny little expression pattern. It, it, you know, the reason why I mention this is because, again, this is just diffusion, diffusion of these proteins. So the only thing that keeps these in these very restricted bands is the fact that other proteins, like giant, will repress gene expression of some of these other proteins. That's what keeps them in these very specific locations in the anterior posterior patterning. And it took a lot of work for them to figure out this hierarchy. <laughs> a lot of, you know, misexpression and knockdown experiments and such. So the gap genes then lead to the next set of transcription factors, which we call the pair rule genes. Now there are lots of pair rule genes. There's there's quite a few. 
The only ones that I really want to um, talk about are Fujitsuratsu and even skip. Those are some of the pair rule genes. Now, you can see that they form very discrete banding patterns, and they don't necessarily all overlap with one another. So Fujitsuratsu and even skip, the way that they're set up, they just have very distinct banding patterns, but they're not found necessarily in the exact same banding patterns. Even though there's about seven bands, um, there's a wide variety of other pair rule genes. And you start getting this overlap of all of these genes that are spaced out amongst the, uh, um, the embryo. So that's all the pair rule genes that I'm going to talk about, Fujitsuratsu, or FTZ, and even skip. Now, the reason why I want to talk about those two pair rule genes is because these are the ones that make all the difference when it comes to the next group, which is the segment polarity genes. Now, at this point of the segment polarity genes, this is where the syncytial nuclei, or the syncytial blastoderm, become cellular blastoderm. Up until this point, all the nuclei have been exposed to the cytoplasm. And all of these morphogen gradients that have been established, and all of these proteins that are being set up in these very discrete banding patterns along the anterior-posterior axis, now the nuclei get uh, um, enclosed in, with the cell membrane, and with that, all of the necessary factors, transcription factors and such, get pulled into the cell as well. And that's what starts causing these cells to then take on very different fates and start interacting with one another. Up until this point, it's all been morphogenic, uh, uh, morphogen gradient. But now we're going to get into paracrine signaling from cell to cell. We didn't call it paracrine signaling initially because it's all one cell. There's no paracrine signaling because they're not multiple cells. Now, with the segment polarity genes, each of these cell cells, nuclei, have been uh, enclosed in the cell membrane, and they'll start expressing various receptors and various proteins. So the segment polarity genes that I want to talk about are, should be very familiar to you. In Drosophila, it's engrailed and wingless. But their homologs are none other than sonic hedgehog and WINT. These are, as you should know, sonic hedgehog pathway and the WINT signal transduction pathway that we talked about. Here, we get reciprocal induction. So the cells that express WINT are in areas that don't have any Fujitsuratsu or even skipped protein. They're in these gaps right between these segment polarity, or uh, uh, between these pair rule genes. That's why I bring the, brought those two up. Because, and there's lots of other things going on here, but I'm trying to keep it as simple as I possibly can. Um, so, Fushitratsu and even skip. You can see these, this is kind of the banding expression pattern of them. Notice how they don't overlap necessarily with one another. But in these tiny little gaps in between them, that's where these cells have the necessary uh, transcription factors that will turn on the Wnt protein. Okay? In other cells where you have high levels of, e it's either even skipped or Fujitsuratsu. It happens in both. But at high levels of even skipped and Fujitsuratsu, you get sonic hedgehog, or in the case of Drosophila, we call it engrailed. So what happens is these cells that are producing the paracrine fractor engrailed have a receptor, which is the frizzled receptor, which the Wnt, or wingless protein here, binds to. And all this does, this reciprocal induction, this cell makes hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, that turns on the Wnt protein here. And the Wnt protein, in turn, through the Wnt signal transduction pathway, turns on sonic hedgehog. So all these do is just maintain Wnt signaling and sonic hedgehog signaling or in the case of Drosophila, engrailed and wingless. That is one of the biggest things we've shown or seen in the development that starts causing a lot of the gastrulation movements that are necessary to create the segments of the Drosophila. What ends up happening is these two become signaling centers, where Wnt just gets expressed in a gradient fashion to these adjacent cells, and sonic hedgehog gets expressed in a gradient fashion to these other cells, and that in turn 
will turn on various genes that are necessary for gastrulation and changes in the cell's differentiation. Okay, so the two segment polarity genes that I, I want you to know are engrailed and wingless, the homologs being hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, and wind. One more difficult hurdle to get over. The last group of genes. Up until this point, each group of genes has built upon the last. The maternal effect genes turn on the gap genes, the gap genes turn on the pair rule genes, the pair rule genes turn on the segment polarity genes. Well, the homeotic selector genes, or the Hux genes, don't get turned on by the segment polarity genes. They get turned on by the gap genes and the pair rule genes. They've shown that that's the case, that the gap genes and the pair rule genes are what cause the patterning of the homeotic selector genes. So that's the only exception to this stepwise process of anterior-posterior patterning. So let's look at this, homeotic genes, or Hox genes in vertebrates. As I mentioned before, these are in the same order on the chromosomes as they are in their anterior to posterior expression. I mean, it's just fascinating, to say the least. Same thing is true for the Hux genes. They're in the same expression pattern uh, in anterior to posterior and in various regions in our body as they're found on, uh, uh, in that. You don't have like Hux 10 here and then 7 there and then 9 there. You get Hux 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, so on and so forth. It's, it's just fascinating how that works. So homeotic selector genes. They don't have the same names as we have. In fact, when we do the Hox genes, we just give them numbers, you know, in terms of which gene that they are. The homeotic selector genes, however, have very specific names. Some of the more prominent ones that you may uh, hear are things like antennapedia, ultrabithorax. Ultrabithorax is really a one that's studied quite a bit um, as they've done studies where if they remove ultrabithorax, then antinopedia actually takes its place and you get two sets of wings like that instead of one. So they've shown that these Hox genes or homeotic selector genes are necessary for proper development of certain structures. If you delete the ultrabithorax gene and you get more of this gene going uh, uh, in this region, you get two wings or two sets of wings instead of one. Another thing is if you have expression of things such as antennapedia, which would normally make these legs in the eye region, then you end up getting limbs in the eyes instead of the eyes themselves. So they've found that these homeotic selector genes play a critical role in further gastrulation and differentiation of key parts of the drosophila for the whole body plan. Okay? One of the things, too, about these is there is a hierarchy on this as well, where each one of these, going from posterior to anterior, supersedes the other, which means the um, abdominal B gene will prevent abdominal A gene from being expressed in this region. It supersedes that gene, and so on and so forth as you go through here. So if you remove ultrabithorax, that's why antennapedia will just take its place because it's not being inhibited by ultrabithorax. So you're seeing the same phenomena here as you saw with the gap genes, where there's a hierarchy of these genes where one can prevent the expression. When you make antennapedia B or abdominal B expression here, you will not get expression of these other homeotic selector genes and so on and so forth. Now this expression pattern that you see right here, again, is solely responsible for which two groups of genes? Gap genes and pair rule genes, good. And that's it. That's as simple as I can make it. Uh, I know when you read in your book, it goes through so much. I told you that I'd mentioned briefly about the dorsal ventralization of uh, Drosophila. It's really simple. Oh, uh, we know a little bit about it, but the main thing that causes it is in, uh, there's a uh, protein called dorsal. Okay? They call it dorsal. That's initially found everywhere in the embryo. Well. In the initial stages, what happens is when you get certain proteins being turned on, dorsal uh, uh, is removed from combining with another protein, and it, it is restricted to the freaking ventral region. So 
dorsal is, is expressed in the ventral region of the uh, drosophila, and that's what creates the, the, the initial stages of gene patterning that create the dorsal ventral axis of the drosophila. Uh, 